Welcome to episode 112 of Woolen Spinning. My name is Rachel. I can be found pretty much everywhere as Well for Pearls. And the blog is at wellforpearls.com. If you have any more questions and you want to know more about what we do here, please reach out, rachel at wellforpearls.com. All right, we've got a packed show today. I have changed the format around quite a bit of the show so that we do our housekeeping at the end of the show and we do all of my like works in progress and stuff to talk about at the beginning of the show and then we do spinning growth after that and then if there's an ask anything we do an ask anything. I'm really hoping that we get to spinning growth today but I am a little bit concerned because the show is so packed so and we may fall down a bit of a rabbit hole later in the show so um, bear with me we'll if we don't get to spinning growth it's not a big deal we can put it into next episode um, I was looking at the patreon last night because I was doing ever um, I was doing all of the uh, you know responding to messages and comments and looking making sure everything was gonna work for today all that kind of stuff and um, we are getting really close to the next milestone like I was shocked at how close we are because I don't look at the numbers very often and um, the next milestone is is getting quite close so that's exciting <laughs> but also nerve-wracking for me because I I'm just I'm just so bowled over by your support and uh, those of you who come to this community whether it's coming to watch the podcast a couple of times a month or coming to interact on patreon or coming into the slack channel or interacting with me on Instagram like it it's I just am so thankful for all of you and I I want you all to know how welcome you are here and that I appreciate each and every one of you and that I hope that this is a very this is a very welcoming community but I hope that that is re that you feel that when you when you come here so know that you are welcome and know that I'm a little bit scared of what is going to happen when we hit that next milestone because we are unlocking basically like craft live sessions and I, I know exactly what it's going to look like but it's really um yeah it's it's sort of like the next thing to tackle so anyhow we need to get into the show uh welcome candy it's been so long i'm so excited to have you here hi carlotta karma suzanne cheryl good morning all of you thank you so much for being here i know rebecca is around somewhere uh, she is joining us from Northern Canada in, uh, in Nunavut, which I am dying to go to. So uh, welcome, Carly. You made it. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, for joining me this morning. I'm going to have a sip of coffee. That is one thing. So <laughs> we're, the whole house is always up by like 6 a.m. It's just that's why I set the live stream for so early. I just knew that we'd be up. The house would be awake. It get it done early I'd be fresh because you know the show is tiring to make because we're so interactive for this whole hour and I set my alarm just in case the house didn't wake up and the house didn't wake up this morning James was up and he was playing Lego and stuff but I I'm so glad I set an alarm so the first thing I did I rolled out of bed I almost stepped on Charlotte because she sleeps on my side of the bed on the floor right there and so I, I missed her. She was she was fine, dog intact, and I went straight downstairs and I put on the coffee pot. <laughs> I had put it all. I never am this organized, but I had put it all together last night. So all I had to do was plug it in. <laughs> I am so glad I did that. So good morning, Rebecca. I was just saying that I hope that you were able to join us. All right, what do we have in store for today? I have a ton of stuff sitting right here. I almost um, showed it to you on this side, but it's actually on this side. I have a bit of a tangent to talk about today, but I hope that it is helpful in terms of the future of the show. Uh, like long-term future, I'm not talking like next month, I'm talking like several years. Um, we also have some works in progress to talk about. I have, what do I have here? I've got a finished object to share with you project planning and then I mentioned it at the beginning when we first started the live stream that I am hoping that we can get to a spinning growth today mostly because it's a really excellent one we haven't done one quite like this for a while and I'm hoping that we can get to it but if we kind of fall down a bit of a rabbit hole talking about the direction of my making and the things that I've been thinking about then 
we'll save that spinning growth for next time. Welcome, Megan. So good to see you. Oh, she laughed when she saw the title of the episode, which is shawl knitting, woven project planning, and holes in socks because she's sitting here darning six socks. <laughs> All right, I have a little bit of community news that I wanted to share with you at the outset of the show, just in case you don't stick around at the end for housekeeping. There is the newest episode of Hand Spinning News has been released. It is a UK publication. It's an online magazine, basically, of spinning, knitting, crocheting, dyeing, and weaving content. But her primary focus is definitely on hand spinning, and she very much highlights hand spinners that are also doing other things. So I, my blog, for example, has been featured a couple of times where I've been knitting with my hand spun or I've been playing with color. This month, Amy King is has a feature in there uh, for some of the videos that she's making. She also links to a really great blog post by April um, about her the wear and tear of her opposing three ply sock yarn after two and a half years. So the blog post, I read it, it's great. It goes through like, there's links to how she made the opposing three ply two and a half years ago. And then the blog post is like, how did they hold up? How was the wear and tear? And there's, and then she also, it, I kind of fell down a bit of a rabbit hole because I knew about this project, but I hadn't, I, I'd read a little bit about it, but I also um, fell down a bit of a rabbit hole because Rebecca, which was linked in April's blog post, there's she's put up even more content about the Naturally Tough Sock Experiment. So the Naturally Tough Sock Experiment is all about working with and spinning fibers for socks that don't require nylon and exploring that idea. So just lots of stuff happening, lots of posts, lots of people posting about things, writing about things. There was a great post about uh, spinning and knitting for cables. There was another one about some dyeing experiments. Anyways, it just, it was a great episode this time around and I usually don't talk about it. So I, about hand spinning news, I sort of gloss over a lot of the stuff happening out there in the community because there's just so much. But I thought I would mention this one because um, they did a great job this time around. And that is hand-spinning-news.com. And you can subscribe. I do pay the five, I think it's like $5 a, a year. I do subscribe, like subscribe. You can get it for free, but I subscribe for the better layout and the better format because I want to support the work that she's doing. So definitely something for you guys to think about. Let's talk about work in progress. I'm going to move the cameras around. We are going to talk about breeding color studies. I completely forgot. Oh, shoot. Okay, we're going to put a pause. I need to get my knitting because I need to show you what I'm working on. So while we're doing that, I'm going to flip the cameras around so that you guys have something beautiful to look at. Hi, Heidi. And then we will talk about the projects that come up. There's two photos this week. I featured two different members of the Ravelry community. And Debbie and Rebecca, sorry, Debbie and Barbara, and you guys can look at the photos and then we're going to chat about it really quickly and I'm going to grab my whip, my work in progress because I left it on the kitchen table because I've been working on it so much. So one minute. So of course I come out of the room and Nora's like, mom, <laughs> she thought I was done. Bless her heart. Okay. What kind of a wheel is that? Oh, the one karma that's in the background of that photo with the pillows is a spin illusion. They have a certain look to them and that's a spin illusion. I'm not totally sure which spin illusion Barbara owns. I'm sure if you looked on her Instagram and I think her Instagram is the same as her, as her um, Ravelry thing. So let me just look really quick because while we're here, let's have the, this conversation. The, I, I'm pretty sure she has an, an echo, but let me just double check. She posts on her Instagram quite a few photos of her Spinolution, but she doesn't actually say which Spinolution wheel she has. <clears throat> 
now when she watches this, she's going to be sitting there. Oh, she does. It is a Spinalution spin Echo. <laughs> when she watches this, she's going to be sitting there going, I have an Echo, I have an Echo. <laughs> anyway, she has a Spinalution Echo there. Sort of moderately sized wheels. They're not as big as the Mach 3. I really like them. I, I've spun on an Echo quite a few times when I was a Spinalution dealer, and I quite liked the Echo. It was sort of my favorite of that line of wheels. So that is that wheel. All right. Let me just catch up with the chat. Chat is always really chatty, <laughs> so it's hard sometimes to keep up, but I just love, oh, hi, Barbara, she's here. Uh, so it's um, it's so great. I just so appreciate you guys. All right, let's talk about these socks and these uh, pillows because they're amazing. And I think I had mentioned to Barb that she was gonna be on the show, so I'm so glad that you're here, Barb. Let's talk about Debbie's socks first. She, this is our breeding color studies. She did her socks in the Starry Night colorway. So we had three colorways for those who are new to the community or maybe just tuning into the podcast for the first time. I'm gonna repeat myself a little bit for re returning viewers and for Patreon community members. But basically we had this time around for the breeding color studies. It started on October 1st. It's gonna end on March 31st, but a lot of people won't finish their spinning and they won't get their knitting done and whatnot, or their weaving or their crochet or whatever they're gonna do with their yarn. So these studies tend to go on like for a really long time, but we sort of stopped talking about it on this show around at the end of March because then we move on to our next one. So our next one is starting on April 1st and Katrina and I will have some information about all of that in, in March for you guys because we're changing the format a little bit. So to leave you with that ginormous teaser, we're gonna, this study was on Massam and so slightly longer wool, classified as a miscellaneous, but very much spins like a long wool, has a gorgeous halo. When I was weaving with it, it very much made me, it reminded me of working with mohair and not because it's mohair, but just because it felt very much like mohair in the weaving process. Anyways, we had this time around, we wanted to try something a little bit different. So we wanted to experiment with white and black in our braid. So what would happen in our, in our braid of hands, hang, um, comb top, if we had like a control colorway with no white and no black in it, what would happen if we added white and black to that braid? So because those two colors lighten and darken and they create tone and they create depth and they create texture and heathering and all this wonderful beautiful stuff. You guys who've been here for a while know that one of my absolute most favorite things to spin with is white. I just love it. And it's not because I like the pastels, it's because I like the heathering that you get. So I love vibrant color on a, a bunch of comb top with these vibrant colors put on and then some white left, some natural, natural white left, na undyed areas. Anyways, so we had the three braids and Debbie's socks are out of the control colorway. So the one that had no white added and no black added. And she said that she actually finds them very soft to touch. And she washed them in the wool setting of her machine, uh, washing machine. And they look fine. <laughs> they obviously did not felt. So my question is, I would love to hear from Debbie what kind of washing machine she has because I just got a brand new washing machine because ours blew up and broke. And I can do my, I have a Woolens setting. It's called Woolens. And I just put a whole bunch of socks through and I did take the risk and I put through my Polar Silk socks just to see. And I was like, I'm just letting go of this. Like if something happens to them, that's, I have to just let that go. Anyways, they were totally fine. So the wash is super, super cold water and the you're supposed to only add like a teaspoon of a very gentle soap. And anyways, there's a whole bunch of like things you're supposed to do. I did all that stuff and same as Debbie, I have, I'm able to machine wash those socks. So I'm just gonna like do some more experiments. I'm gonna do some swatches, wash them up, see how they end up. And then Barb has, oh, and she did say that there has been a bit of pilling on one of the socks, and I did notice that she used a different yarn for the heels. So I would be curious to know why she did that, what the what the impetus behind that was. Was she concerned about the wear and tear of this yarn she spun? Because it looks like a commercial. So I'd love to know more, Debbie. And then Barb made these amazing pillows. These are amazing. So I had mentioned on the show last time that we had found these, me and Katrina, and that we had, you know, looking on Instagram and Ravelry and whatnot. And Katrina messaged me, texted me the photo of these pillows. And she's like, oh my gosh, aren't these amazing? 
Because it's so, as a dyer, the most amazing thing is to see what people do with your stuff, whether it's knitting or weaving or spinning. Like, it's just the most amazing feeling. And her and I, together, just the two of us, have talked about that a lot. So when she saw these, she just was like, oh, my goodness. So well done, Barb. She... I, I, yeah, she said she folded them in the washing machine. She wanted a tighter structure, which makes sense for pillows. You want them to wear. And she said they're very soft and they have a halo, which they totally look like they do. And they just look amazing. People in the chat have some great questions for Barb. So I'm hoping that she answers them and then I'll share them with you. Yeah, Gina, I we are having a Saturday show. I'll tell you guys about that later, why, we're, why we mix things up. But I was hoping that those of you who aren't able to come during the week were, would be able to come on the weekend and that we'd have sort of a slightly different chat group and hopefully catch those of you who aren't able to make the live stream um, when we do it during the week. So I'm glad that that works for you this morning. So... These are totally amazing. I've never wanted to weave pillows before, but now I have pillow envy. I love that, Megan. That's hilarious. Pillows are gorgeous. Yeah, you guys are so great. I'm ironing my latest project off the loom. That's great, Suzanne. I'm so glad that you're weaving. Welcome, Linda, to the chat. So good to have you here. It's amazing how different the pillows look. Yeah, so in the pillows she used the white colorway with one and then the black colorway with the other. And it's funny because they look, Katrina and I were actually talking about this. I should have shared this with you guys. It, they look like they go together and yet they're different enough that they look like that they're interesting to look at. I think that's partly what captures us when we look at the photo. It's like, you know they go together because they're similar colors and they look like a set. But they're interesting because of the black and the white and the play of that and the play of the colors. That's why black and white is so amazing. It makes me want to pull out the loom and see what I can come up with. Yes, right, Cheryl? That's the thing about this community. Like, you look at what people are making and what people are doing and you're just like... You just end up so inspired. You know, I find sometimes I almost get paralyzed. Like it's too many projects and it's too much to feel inspired about. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, I can't. Like this is just too much. I want to do all the things. So it's been good. I've been buttoning down on, on, on some of this stuff and what I want to do. All right. I'm going to change the cameras around. Bear with me. I'm going to move all of this wonderful stuff out of the way because we're going to talk about it later. And I am going to ch chitty chat about my, my Braden color studies. So I'm going to show you very quickly. I'm not going to move the cameras around. I wove a blanket with mine. I'm not going to talk about this today. I mentioned it quite a bit last show, but I'm just going to give you sort of a bit of a teaser. And then we're going to chat about this more in March. Um, it's not finished yet and I still need to do the fringes and I need to fix some mistakes. And then here's the fringe. I've half finished the fringe. I've done one side and then I'm just doing the other side. And normally I wasn't going to do the fringe, I was going to leave it, but because I, I just love the look of the, I love the look of unfinished fringes. Like I just love just fringe. But in the end, I am going to finish the fringes because um, I need to brush this. And so I don't want to, if I, I don't want to end up with this really scraggly fringe. Anyways, we will talk about that more in March because I've got some work to do on it still. And I, yeah. I just am not ready to talk about it yet. <laughs> All right. I purposefully didn't work on this last night because I knew that I would end up in the middle of a row. And then you guys will be mad at me because I won't be able to really show this to you. Yeah, Cheryl, I'm going to talk about the blanket more in, in April or sorry, in March. I've got tons and tons to share with you about it. And it would take like just 20 minutes on its own. So we're going to talk about it in, in, in March. So sorry to leave you hanging. It's just, it was a huge project. It was a bit of a heartbreaker and, uh, I'm really happy with how it turned out, but I just want to like leave that for now because I'm still working on it. And in the meantime, we are going to talk about this beauty. 
Um, this is my breeding color study leftover yarn. So when I had, so I am going to, I guess I am going to talk about the blanket for a minute because th that's why I have all of this yarn left over to be able to knit this shawl. So I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. So the blanket was woven on my rigid heddle uh, by 32 inch Ashford and I warped it all up with a 12 and a half dent reed. Totally fine. No problem. And then I went to weave and the yarn was sticking together really, really terribly. And so then I, I'm a member of Jane Stafford's online guild. If you don't know what that is and you're not a weaver, it doesn't really affect you. But if you are a weaver and you're not a member, I'd highly recommend going and checking it out. She's literally creating an online guild for weavers. And she kind of starts at the beginning in episode one with like very basic stuff like winding a warp, which we're going to talk about later. And then as those seasons and as the episodes progress, there's more and more and more information and she goes in more and more depth. So she kind of takes you along on this like journey. And then there's the forums and people ask questions and interact and it's just amazing. And there's really experienced weavers in there that are like, they've been weaving for 50 years and they're just, they're, they're a wealth of knowledge. And then there's people like me. So who know nothing. I had done a woven sample of the yarn and I knew what I wanted my set to be at and for whatever reason I kind of just threw it out the window and was like no no I want a tighter weave I want more like a fabric maybe I'm going to make pillows da 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 and I shouldn't have done that and K Chrissy made a really interesting comment she's uh, snappy stitches over on um, snappy stitches podcast and then on Instagram she's manic I think she's still manic pearl maybe she's Chrissy design anyway she's changed her her um, usernames online a couple of times to kind of you know redirect where she what she's doing and where she's going anyways Chrissy's amazing she's a good friend of mine we live like 20 minutes away from each other and her she said on the weaving show because she started a, a new podcast about a year ago and I'm not sure what she's doing with it and if she's going to continue because I'm pretty sure she told me that she sold all of her looms and stuff so I don't think she's going to continue. But on one of the episodes, the reason why I'm telling you all of this is because on one of the episodes she said that she was realizing that she was very much a maker who kind of flies by the seat of her pants and makes a lot of decisions while she's creating and while she's making. So I had just had this experience with the blanket while I'm re-watching her weaving show. And I thought, you know, that's a lot of what I do. Like, I don't necessarily always do control cards. I don't always necessarily do gauge swatches. I don't always necessarily know exactly what needle size I'm going to use or the direction that I'm going to go. And then I make decisions as I go. And you can't really do that in weaving until you've got I'm not sure you can ever do it, but for me at the beginning, you certainly can't do it when you're a beginner. So I warped up my rigid heddle with a 12 and a half dent reed, and I should have warped it up with a seven and a half dent reed. So the very different for the weavers out there, that's like two completely different sets. So think knitting gauge. Basically, I, if you're a knitter, basically I went to knit on like three millimeter needles when I should have been knitting on like six and a half millimeter needles. That would be like, so I, I needed a loose open, open fabric and I was on a very dense, heavy fabric. And the shed wouldn't open and close, like it wouldn't open and close properly and it wouldn't drop down properly because everything was stuck together and the set was too tight. So I ended up having to pull my warp off. I untied it from the front beam, pulled it through the heddle, like I pulled it, I pulled it all out, all the threading, I pulled it all out and I put a different heddle on, a different reed I, and I re-threaded it all. But this is why I'm telling you all of this. I ended up with a whole bunch of warp threads that I didn't need. So I just threw them over the back of the loom. By the way, everything that I did, you're not supposed to do. So like do as I say, not as I do. I ended up with uh, the warp threads falling off the back of the loom but I ended up with all of these like warp threads that were however long they were kind of just remember how long my warp was now that like I, I have it all written down somewhere but not in here because I wasn't going to talk about this today so I have all these warp threads that were from the back of the loom that kind of just came along for the ride because I couldn't take them off the loom because they were still in the back beam wound up as warp 
but they're cut, right? Because it's a warp. So you, this, you know, I had one end originally tied to the front and then one end originally tied to the back. So I just kind of had to let them hang back there and, to, and, and slowly unravel as I wove. The whole thing was a disaster, very humbling. But I ended up with like all these like bunches of yarn. So this is the control colorway. And I ended up with a whole bunch of white and I ended up with a whole bunch, only a little bit of black. This is all I have left of my black yarn. And then I had this that I never did warp. This is just control colorway that it's just not warp. So I decided I had so much of it that I started knitting with it. So there's tons and tons of joins in here. Like if you look on the back, I'm gonna have a heck of a time weaving in ends, but I've got all these joins of where all of my warp threads ended and where I had to start new warp threads and whatnot. But I've just been knitting, holding the two yarns together and knitting like five to seven stitches. And then I'll wash it and block it and then I'll trim all this stuff at the back. So I don't actually have anything to like weave in. I just have to be aware that I have all of these areas at the back where it's all joined. And I'm doing this shawl is the one that is from the book that Katrina and I are writing that we're almost done. We're putting on finishing touches. We're, we're getting there. I'm just testing this pattern one more time because my friend just knit it for us again. So it's been knit. This will be the third time. And I also thought it was just a perfect pattern to showcase the yarn because you've got these striping with the areas, with the stripes that are the contrast color. So this first part, these first four stripes are all of the white. And I've just down here added the control colorway. Um, so the, now, I've, now I'm into the control colorway. And you can see that that last stripe is slightly darker. And then I'll finish off with the black. And then I'll finish with a big garter stitch border in the white. And the white is my super old, it's from my stash, 2014, hand combed Coriadale. And I have tons of this fiber in my stash. I never came back to this project or finished it. This is, I had 225 yards that I had combed and made into a two ply. And I said to Mike, this is great because when I get to the end, I'm just gonna comb up a whole bunch more, spin some more and finish off the shawl so that, cause I want this really big I, I want a really big garter border on this shawl. And so I'm gonna do that. I'm seeing if I can find the tag for this, but I don't know where it is. And I'll um, do this really big, really big garter stitch border and spin up some more. So I'm really excited. It It's sort of one of those projects that ended up being like, you know, the blanket and the shawl ended up being like, in the end, really great. Um, and they could have been really big disasters and they kind of ended up being disasters and then I was able to rectify it. So you can see the progression of the white, like these are the four stripes and you can see now I'm down into the control colorway down here and it's getting a little bit darker, but the white, you can see the heathering of the white. I think it's really pretty. I'm really happy with it. I've had quite a few compliments when I've been out in the community knitting on it. I'm just going to catch up with chat. Yeah, there is no the wrong way to do things, Suzanne. You're right. I think in this case with the weaving, there really that was wrong. <laughs> it created some disaster on the loom, which is what, what I'll talk about in March. Uh, don't do what I did. It just wasn't worth it. <clears throat> it's quite assuring to hear that more experienced crafters have issues too. You could weave in the ends as you go. Yeah, so what I've been doing, Eve, with my ends is just knitting the two yarns together and that's actually been working really well. They'll kind of rub together and lock together and then I can just trim them as I go. Um, I have a lot of ends at the end of the shawl. That's the only thing. So out here, I do need to weave all this stuff in and I, I tried to weave it in on the while I was knitting, but I just couldn't. It's just a little bit, so I'm, I, I will have quite a bit of weaving in to do, but not in the body of the shawl, which, which is nice. <clears throat> I keep saving bits of leftover hand spun, believing there's a project out there. Absolutely, Barb, there is. <laughs> um, you may not think it now, but there is a project out there for it. And this actually, this shawl, I've come back to, I've knit this now three times, twice like as a test knit, and then once was the original 
sort of pattern that I developed, the original tutorial. So it's a little bit different from, from this one and the other one that I've done for the book. That's actually the one that's photographed in the book. And it's funny because I just, I keep coming back to this and I never re-knit stuff. But when it comes to socks and these types of shawls, I, I have found that I keep coming back to them because they're such great use for hand spun. So like I knit the fish lips kiss heel over and over and over again because it fits my foot. And then this one I've found that I keep coming back to. So it's kind of neat. I cord edging, edging hide. That's right, Eve. That's such a good point. I could have thought about doing that. That's a great idea. And I cord edging because they hide so much stuff. Yeah, it's, I'm glad I was able to save it too. It uh, makes a big difference. All right. Mm. True, Suzanne. That's so true. Not wrong. It was a learning opportunity. That's so true. You know what? That's, yeah, that's very wise. You're absolutely right. And you know, it really, one of the things that, that an experience like that taught me, and I've talked about this on the show before, it really made me realize that I need to trust my gut. Um, when my gut is telling me one thing and my head is telling me a different thing, I think it's really important at that point to slow down a little bit and say like, why are these two not in synchrony? Like why is, why am I sort of thinking I should do one thing and not, and doing another? And I think that was a big reinforcement for me that like in those situations, I probably just need to put it aside for a bit. So. Oh, that's awesome, Cheryl. So she knit a shawl for her sister for Christmas and she put colors that go together next to each other and it turned into an amazing asymmetrical shawl. And it was a fun way to use small bits of hand spun. That's a great idea. And then it wouldn't matter how much you have either. You could just sort of blast through your, your stash. Sorry, I'm just catching up. Definitely listen to that nagging, nagging suspicion that something is wrong and not rush ahead. I'm always making that mistake in my sewing. I think, yeah, I think for many of us makers, that's definitely the case. We you know, we rush ahead and we think we've got it all organized and then, you know, disaster strikes. All right, I have another project that is in progress and I just wanted to give you a really quick update about it. My Smith & You Superwash Nylon, Superwash Merino Nylon, I think it's a 2080 split or 1585, I can't remember. Anyhow, um, I have finished all my singles, so it's 150 grams of yarn. I divided it up into four and I've been spinning to four bobbins. And my plan is to make a cabled yarn. So I spun on my Lendrum at 17 to one, which just took a while, it's a little bit slower. I sort of wish I had put the project on my Susie at 27 to one, just so I could spin a bit faster, but I had a different project on that wheel at that time, which I'll show you next. And then because I had so many singles, I, th I'm sure that this yarn is going to be in the 600 or 700 ballpark for yardage. I've been rewinding so that I'm plying from the first spun end, not from the last spun end. I've been rewinding my bobbins onto my Leclerc weaving bobbins. So I will talk about this later in the show, but I went to, I went, Nora and I went on a little bit of a pilgrimage this week. We had a really quiet day on Thursday. We had no plans and, um, I wanted to get some weaving stuff and so we went down to my friend Brenda's shop, Penelope Fiber Arts, and she's about 40 minutes door to door from our house. And Nora was up for the, um, she was up for the, the journey, if you will. She actually ate her lunch while we were driving, which was great. We were chit chatting away and it's such an easy drive. It's just, it takes a while. And I had one of these Leclerc weaving bobbins. They look like this standing up. Anyways, they're only four bucks and they fit on the Ashford bobbin winder, but you have to pop them up. If you have an Ashford bobbin winder, like a manual one, there's the bobbin winder, like the part that the bobbin sits on. And then there's like another part up top that's like a little, like a, a washer kind of, but it's thick. I'm not explaining it very well, but I did shoot some video. Anyways, these fit perfectly up onto that because Ashford weaving bobbins are smaller than all of the other bobbins out there on the market. The other ones are all standardized except for those. So I just pop them up onto that and they work beautifully. And the reason why I like these, I had one, I wanted to see if they would work with my bobbin winder before I bought more because they're $4 each. Like, you know, they're not expensive, but you know, they're four bucks. And what do you do with it if it doesn't work? Brenda had said she would take it back if it didn't work with my Ashford bobbin winder. But the reason why I like these is they're bigger. Uh, my Ashford bobbins are really shallow. They look like this. 
And you guys remember the great sock experiment. I'm actually wearing the socks of whatever year it was, 20, 2018, I guess, was that when I knit, when I spun and knit those Suffolk socks and all of the singles jumped off the end. So these do fit about 25 grams of spun fiber, but anything that's really springy or springy, I won't put on these anymore. And now I have four of these. So I bought another three and I, James helped me yesterday and we wound two of the bobbins of four and I'll do another two today and get that all plied. So I'm actually halfway through plying this first pair. Uh, Charlotte got all tangled up in them last night. She, I don't know what she was doing. I think she must have smelled food or something. And she got all tangled up and broke the single. So I was actually like, oh, that's great, because then I can show it on the show. <clears throat> oh, that did not go in my little basket. The other thing about this spin that I'm finding, because my plan is to cable the yarn, in my plying, I put it on my Susie, on my Magicraft, and I'm plying it 27 to 1, and I'm just trying to pack as much ply twist in as possible, and then I keep, as I'm going, I keep pulling the yarn off of the bobbin and doing plyback tests of the yarn to see if it's plied enough, because I want like a really high twist to ply for when I go to cable the two yarns together to make a cable yarn. For those who are brand new spinners and don't know what I'm talking about, with four ply cabled yarn, basically you spin four singles going in the clockwise direction or the Z twist direction. I always encourage people to start talking in terms of S twist and Z twist because then when you're talking to somebody else, you're not getting counterclockwise and clockwise and spinning to the left and spinning to the right, getting all mixed up. The jargon is Z twist, S twist. S twist is counterclockwise, Z twist is clockwise. So these, my singles were spun Z twist and then you ply two of your singles together and two of your singles together and you make two two ply yarns that are S twist, so plied yarns, but you have to put in at least twice the twist amount so that when you go to ply, to cable those two two plies together, in the Z twist direction, they're actually able to lock together and actually come together as a cable yarn. When I finish this, we'll talk about that more on the podcast, but I am in the process right now of plying and trying to get all of that ply twist in there. So I started it yesterday afternoon. We had just a quiet afternoon. We had a play date in the morning with two friends and the house was overrun with kids and busyness and then after everybody went home, I could tell the kids were really ratty with each other and they were just tired and fighting and it was just like they were just grumpy. So we made a little, um, like a little fort kind of thing and the kids had a snack in there and I let them watch an episode of Captain Underpants, and which is the silliest show ever, I don't understand it at all. And they, and then James came out and he's like, can you teach me how to knit? And I was like, yes. <laughs> My little mama heart just grew like three, three times. So he sat on the couch with me and he worked on it for like 15 minutes, which is a long time for a six-year-old boy. And he, uh, by the end of it, he was actually like getting the stitches. And we talked about like the rabbit goes in the hole, the rabbit jumps on the stick and the, and the rabbit and the stick come out. And he just got it like that. It was really cool. And then of course, Nora wanted to learn. She got it as well. Not as well as James because she's younger, but He's like, I want to learn how to knit. So kind of neat. He was weaving the other week. I've got photos of that that I can share with you guys next show if you're interested. He wove on the rigid heddle. It's really neat. All right. Oh, yeah, Z and Z. Z twist and Z twist. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the Canadian versus American way of saying Z. <laughs> um, that's so funny. Oh, hi, Naomi. Rebecca said Naomi said hello. All right, the, I can't remember who said this, but the best mnemonic I heard was, it was Z is Z right. Oh, that's, that's kind of neat. Not that I think in terms of Z, but for those of you who are American, the Z to, is to Z right. So there you go. All right. 
That's awesome. I love hearing about kids learning how to knit and learning how to weave and stuff. James really wanted to learn how to spin yesterday because, of course, I was plying. But I told him no because I have projects on both wheels right now. And I was like, I, I will teach you. And, of course, I sold the polywog, so we don't have that anymore. And I said, uh, but I, I said to him, like, just not right this second. I just, no. <laughs> okay, let's shift a little bit. And we're going to talk about a finished spin. And I'll try not to fawn over it too much. This is Crafty Jack's, oh, <laughs> Zawalu, that's hilarious. She's like, she's in the chat. She's like, why is everyone saying my name all of a sudden? She's like, my friends call me Z. That's hilarious. Now I'm going to call you Z. That's easy to remember. Okay. This is Crafty Jack's Fiber Club for her February. So it was 100% Rambo Lay. It was the basic club. I'm not sure exactly what she calls it. It's not the luxury club this month that I spun for her. This is Rambo. It was, she, she made Rolex. I'm going to show you a picture of them because the Rolex were so beautiful that this sat on my table right here. And I didn't spin it for like 10 days after she gave it to me. And I, like, I needed to start working on it right away because like I needed to get it done for this show, but the Rolex were so beautiful that I didn't want to touch them. <laughs> and if I didn't have to spin it, if I had just had it, like if I was a Fiber Club member, uh, like like paying for it and I wasn't spinning it for, for to show you guys and for the show and to help out Katrina, um, and for the pure enjoyment, let's be honest, I would have, this would have like sat in my stash for years, like on display because the, I don't, I'm not a big pink person. You guys know that, but the Rolex were beautiful. So let me show you. She really knocked it out of the park with this one. So here's the Rolex. Let me just, I'm going to make my brightness brighter so that you guys can really see it. So there was some peach in there. There was some, and then there's the pink and the blue, which I just loved. And I got a little stack of these. She gave me six to spin. So I think it was about 50 grams. I haven't actually measured the, measured the weight. And she, my original plan was to spin these short backward draw and just to smooth the fibers and I would just sort of play. But in the end, it's really hard to spin roll eggs sort of a worsted way when you pre-draft. So I ended up spinning them long draw. It's not super, super consistent. I'm a little bit disappointed in my consistency because I haven't spun long draw for a while. I said to Katrina, I was texting with her. We text every day, like many, many times. And if, if cell phone companies, remember when cell phones first came out and then there was like the progression to SMS texting and like texting and you had to pay per text. I don't know if you guys ever had that in the States, but in Canada we had to pay per text. So you could get a plan that was like, you know, you could send 50 texts a month or a hundred texts per month or 200 per month or like, or, or unlimited. And then you paid for that and so on and so forth. Anyways, if that was still the case, I would be paying like a million dollars a month because of the number of texts that Katrina and I t send each other every month, every day. <laughs> I, can't wait. I would need like unlimited daily texts. Um, it's just ridiculous. Anyways, I was texting with her and I was saying, and I was saying like, it's funny how I just don't spin a lot of long draw. Uh, it's not because I don't not have the fibers in my stash. It's not because I don't not pull those fibers out and work with them. I do prefer the long wools. You guys know that. I do prefer a, a smooth worsted draft for sure. Like I very much go, my default is very much short backward draw. I like the look of smooth fibers. Like my, my favorite, favorite yarns is a yarn like this. Like to me, this is like yarn perfection. I would want to weave with this. I would want to knit with this. I could work with this for my whole life doing lots of different stuff and I'd be the happiest. I just love these long, longer medium, medium and longer wools for all of the stuff that they can do. This is Coriadale. I'm actually wondering if this is tuna, Tunis. I'm actually thinking this is not Coriadale. It's got an incredible sheen. This is from my shawl project. I'm pretty sure this isn't Corydale. I think this is my Tunis spin. I'm gonna have to look at the ball band again because I didn't actually look at the ball band. I only looked at the yardage when I when I went to wind this. And this looks like my Tunis. It's got just an incredible sheen. It's not like Corydale at all. Huh. <laughs> I'm gonna have to look at that. It doesn't matter. It's just, 
Yeah, I just I was just looking at the sheen as I was talking about it and I was like, wait a second. Anyways, I love those long like comb top like hand comb top long longer stapled. Anyways. And I've sort of gotten out of the habit of doing a lot of long draw type spinning. And it's just because it's not really been what I've been working on lately. We've been doing a lot of worsted spun sock yarns and Anyways, this was just lovely, but I can't believe how rusty I am in terms of long draw. And we were talking about like that muscle memory and, you know, with English long draw, you draw out a certain amount of, of fiber and then you, and then you, you know, attenuate, you continue to attenuate that, that certain length of, of single until it's even and then you run it into the wheel. Yeah, it's just that in an American long draw, you're drawing back the whole time and you sort of get into this, you know, there's the supported long draw where you're drawing back as, as the twist runs in and you're, you know, you pinch and pull, pinch and pull, but that's continuous. So a little bit two slightly different techniques. I was, I was kind of going back and forth with both with this just to like remember. So I ended up with not a super, super consistent yarn. However, the poof and the sproying of the BFL is just lovely. And I really love this yarn. And it's funny because they're not really my colors. I, you know, I love blue and I love coral, but like I'm not, I'm not a super, I'm not a super pink person, but Nora loved it. She like kept fawning over it while I'm spinning and she's looking at my bobbins and she's touching them and oh mama, I like that yarn. Da, da, da. You know, and I'm just like, Rolly, like what's going on? Like Zora doesn't, she pays attention, but she's usually wanting to make her own stuff. So if I'm making something, she wants to do her own thing. So I, I'm going to do something for her eventually. Probably not this year because I already knit her, her mittens this year, but I'm going to put this in my stash and I'm going to save it for something for her because she just loved it. And I was even thinking maybe about doing a, some sort of a, a toque. Sorry, it's cut out again. So let me just, uh, hopefully you guys didn't experience too much of a jump. Do some people get more bloom and poof because their yarns are airier? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think with the Rambo, if you really try to preserve that that underlying crimpiness of the original fiber and you don't add a lot of twist and you really try to, you know, keep it keep it open and keep it airy, I think you do really you accentuate those those that nature of the fiber. This I got quite a bit of bloom and quite a bit of poof. I soaked it in eucalyn for, in, in warm water for about 40 minutes. It's only because I forgot about it. That wasn't really the plan. And I think I ended up with quite a bit of bloom and quite a bit of poof in it. And it's quite lovely. Um, it's a lovely sprungy yarn. And I got over 200 yards, um, which is pretty good for, for such a, such a sprungy yarn. Cause this is definitely like a DK. And there's areas that are really consistent and then there's areas that are a little bit thicker and a little bit thinner, but I was actually thinking maybe I would crochet a toque for her with it. So, cause it's super warm. But anyways, I just wanted to um, say like, you know, I, I just love these projects that again, you know, you, you're not super, you know, you're sort of like, ah, about the color and then you spin it and you're just like, ah, oh, so awesome. And then also remembering as spinners that if you want to really hone your skills, you need to practice stuff all the time. You can't let it lapse for months and months and months or years and years and years. If you want to be really good at long draw, you need to do it all the time. If you want to be really good at worsted, you need to do it all the time. It's just a fact. Um, you know, and you don't use it, you lose it. And yes, there's a certain degree of like, you know, muscle memory and all that kind of stuff. But really, if you want to be really good at this, this, some of these different drafts, you need to be using them all the time and practicing all the time. We were talking about that actually yesterday with my girlfriends that were over, we were talking about this idea of like, what do we do with our time? And I said, you know, I get messages and emails and whatnot from people like saying, you know, I'm a new spinner. I'm just wondering like, how can I improve? And how do I, you know, get past these beginner yarns that I'm making? And you know, I was there when you know, at, at one point, like I remember that feeling of, oh, my yarn's ever going to get like, to be usable, even though beginner yarns are usable, but in the moment you feel like they're not. And I always say like, you've got to, you've got to sit down at the wheel every day, five minutes, 15 minutes, every single day. And we've talked about that so much in the community. So just a big uh, reminder, super crimpy fibers have more bloom. Yes, absolutely. And they tend to be the fine yarns. So Merino, Rambo, Targi, Polworth has lovely bloom and sprunginess. 
and the other one is Cormel. I love spinning Rambo and Polworth on my Turkish spindles to really preserve that poof. Yes, I love spinning these fine wools on my spindles. And that is so funny because that takes us into our next thing. Good segue there, um, China, because that takes us into my next thing that I want to talk about. So this is spun on my Turkish spindles back in 2016. See if I can get this in focus for you guys. This is Sweet Georgia. It was a club colorway after her daughter, her youngest, was born. And it was called Eden because they named their daughter Nina Eden. I'm not sure it's going to focus really very well. And this, I spindle spun this. So this was BFL, it's a BFL silk. And I spindle spun it. It was 100 grams, so 113 grams, for full four ounces. And I spun it on my Turkish spindles and it was just amazing the the bloom that I got afterwards and the poof that I got from just the weight of the spindle pulling on those fibers as I was spinning. Amazing yarn. I've been coveting this yarn for so long. Part of it's because of the colors. The purples and the blues are just beautiful in it. There's some white in there that was that was left. There's a little bit of pink and that turquoise that you see and it's just a gorgeous color and actually if you want I'll take the moment bye Rebecca I'll, I'll take a moment and I'll show you guys the original skein because I have my Ravelry project page up here from showing you the roll leg so if you don't mind waiting just two seconds and I'll show you here it is so I spun this just have to try my brightness again. Sorry, guys. You guys are so patient with me. Thank you. This was the original yarn, so that's what it looked like. Isn't that incredible? I just love this yarn. And I've, like I said, I've been kind of saving it. So I've kind of fallen down this weaving rabbit hole. And I'm, we're going to shift a little bit now, and we're going to talk about my... Um, and I think we're going to save our spinning growth for next show, because we're going to talk about this for so the remainder of the show. I, I, um, weaving the blanket that I'm going to talk about in March, the, the breeding color studies blanket has really helped me to begin to articulate some of the things about my making and some of the things that have been, that I've been ruminating on for the last year or so. Figuring out things like the direction of the podcast, figuring out the direction of my making, figuring out the direction of our home and what we want our home to be like and the environment that we want to live in and the environment that I want to make in. I'm trying to talk Mike into building me a studio in the backyard in our 10 by 10 shed, but so far he's not going for it. And just trying to figure out how all of this fits together. How is the pot? Where does the podcast fit into all of this? Where does my making fit into all of this? And then where does like the home that we want to have fit into all of this? And I weaving that blanket really helped me to figure out what that all maybe is going to start to look like. So I sold my Ashford e spinner. I am going to sell my Shacked Sidekick. And I, I have a potential buyer for it, so don't message me about the sidekick. But if she decides not to pursue it, then I'll let you guys know on the, on the uh, podcast. And I, over the last year, I've been really feeling like I want to pare down my tools, have a few tools that are like the, the ones that I go back to all the time, that I use all the time, that I enjoy all the time, that I really am excited about. And it's this whole Marie Kondo kind of idea around sparking joy. And when I sit down at my Susie, that I that it sparks joy, that I'm excited to use it. And it's not about getting rid of all of our stuff or getting rid of all our tools or anything. It's just sort of reframing and rethinking. And weaving on the blanket and weaving on the rigid heddle and whatnot, it really made me realize that I really want to go to that next level. I want to go to that next stage in my making of taking it one step further to creating cloth. I've always wanted to do that. I've talked about it on the podcast. I have explored that with friends. I've, it's always been, when am I going to get to that point where I'm ready to take on that next step? And I think we're finally there. Nora's going to kindergarten in September. The podcast is 
this amazing space for me to come and talk to you guys and to explore all of this with you. So what I decided to do was to start biting off small chunks of sort of moving in this direction. So I pulled this out of my stash. I let Nora go through my box of hand spun. I've got a, I have a bin and it's full of hand spun yarn and it's, I don't have tons and tons of hand spun yarn because I tend to use it, but I pulled this out and I said, what do you think about me, about mommy making something for you, Nora? for down the road. So we're going to kind of make it, but we'll maybe put it away or maybe you can wear it once in a while, but you know, we'll make, we'll make something with it. So we're going to do a scarf. And I went to Brenda's shop this past week and I found this. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about this. This is Henry's attic. It's called Snowflake. And I don't know if you can see as I'm slow, I'm trying to slowly turn it, but unfortunately I don't know if the definition on the live stream you'll be able to see it probably on the podcast when it's released later today for patrons but basically it's I'm going to put it down here because it's actually quite heavy it's and you can see the sheen without focusing the camera you can see the sparkle in there it's mohair silk and sparkle yeah the camera's not going to focus give me two seconds See that? Ha ha ha. Can hack the camera. Isn't that incredible? Oh. Okay, so this cone is a pound. And guess how much it costs? <laughs> I didn't pay for it. Um, guess how much it costs? It's just insane. Like insane. I'm going to let you guys guess. I'm going to carry on. Anyways, what I am planning on doing, Felicia, my, my dear friend Felicia, talked about on taking back Friday. And if you guys don't watch that podcast, um, it's great. It's like a vlog format. It's 10 to 20 minutes long. She goes through very specific projects and things that are going on. It's just, it's just great. Anyways, she, um, did this scarf that she did a hand spun warp, but then she did a commercial weft and she actually used silk and oil, which I have some, um, out in the other room. And I just thought that would be amazing with this yarn over here in the corner um, as the warp and this as the weft. It would cause this little fuzziness. So I've already calculated my set. Um, it's going to be spun at seven and a half ends per inch. And I am so excited to get this on the loom. So I'm going to switch cameras around. <laughs> you know, Becky, it cost the, it was the cost of your firstborn child pretty much. Heidi, you're close. You guessed a hundred dollars. Uh, this, if you wanted to go to the store and buy this right now, it's $200 Canadian. So not as much American, but still it's pricey. So Brenda sent me home with it and um, I'm going to take off of it what I want. And then I'm going to take it back and pay her for what I want. Um, because she's, her plan is to skein this all up and she just, with Fibers West coming, she hadn't had an opportunity to do that. So we chatted a little bit and she is going to, uh, and she said, just take it home and take what you want. And then, so I'm figuring it'll be like between twenty and thirty dollars because this this thing of yarn is not very big. So I'm gonna warp it up. So that brings me to my next thing, and I'm gonna move my cameras around, and we're gonna I'm gonna show you guys what I acquired. If you don't follow me on Instagram, you wouldn't have seen this. I'm just gonna press play. So the Langley my guild, the Weavers and Spinners Guild. She. She uh, has this loom, our president of, of our guild. She has this loom. It's a Louette Jane, and she works for Jane Stafford, and she was able to get this loom, and it's an eight harness loom. It's a table loom. The Louette Jane comes in two sizes. This is the bigger one. It's the 27-inch wide weave weaving width, and she offered to lend it to me while I'm deciding what I'm going to do because it gets me onto a harness, onto a, onto a shaft loom, onto a harness loom, shaft loom, and gives me some help and foundation and I can work through like, you know, winding a warp and getting it onto the loom. And she walked me through this whole process of putting the warp on. She spent like four hours at our house last Sunday. It was amazingly generous, just incredibly generous of her to spend that time with me. And um, she helped me to get it all going and she showed me how to use the, uh, the, um, the, 
the treadles, the hand, the hand, um, what are they called? The hand, oh my goodness, I'm just having a um, mental block. And showed me how to beat, showed me how to, you know, and I knew how to throw a shuttle and I knew how to do all of that from doing the rigid heddle. So she kind of tweaked me and gave me a couple of pointers and just left me to roll with it. So this is this project, they're sort of rug rug uh, mug rugs, uh, is almost done. Um, I've just been working on it throughout the week and just playing with it and whatnot. And she is, and then I'm, I'll take this off probably later today. And I wound my very first warp all by myself. So I'm going to put this on the loom at some point next week, hopefully. Wah! This is a nine foot warp and I have a very specific project for this. I'm going to be making um, some shawls and stuff, but I thought, well, if I'm going to be winding a warp, I'm going to maximize my yardage. And I worked out all the math and I did all of the project planning and I double checked everything. And I, um, this is Katrina's tough and tender in the new Dawn colorway. It's her fingering weight yarn and I've got all of my math done and I've got all my stuff organized and I'm going to put this on the loom next. I'm so excited. I almost put this on my, on my rigid heddle, uh, and just warped it, uh, front to back instead, but I'm going to put it on the Jane cause I want more, more experience dressing a loom. And if I completely screw up, I can call Jeanette and ask her for, for her help. But isn't that exciting? My very first chain all by myself. Uh, I did a chain with Jane with Jeanette last weekend, so it was sort of it was my first chain, but it, like she helped me, and then this is my very first chain all by myself. I'm all grown up now. I have my own chain. I know how to warp. So cool, tying my cross and doing all the math and figuring it all out. It was so awesome. I'm just gonna catch up with chat because you guys are are um, have some great things to say. So while it says I've been struggling with my weaving a little bit, combining my hand spun and finding different patterns I like, and I didn't think of flipping things like that at all. Maybe th something to consider. Okay, so Zualu had Z had thought that I would say that I would do a hand spun weft in a commercial warp, but my interest is really really lies in how can we push our hand spun and how can we kind of go to that next level. I think there's a um, there seems to be a, an overarching sort of mindset out there that you can't use your hand spun for your warp and there's really no reason like I've used hand spun warp on my rigid heddle tons of times I've watched others weave with their hand spun in our guild and use it for warp and weft and everything like it's just that's how they used to make warp like there didn't always there wasn't always industrial machines to make commercial warp and weft threads right so yeah that's where I'm really interested is like flipping that around and and like how do we push our hand spun yarns and what do they look like in fabric and how do they act and I'm just so enamored with it all. I just, I just, I feel like there's so many places that I could go. So yeah, I'm just so excited. I like using hand spun for warp as you can add, as you can use up odds and ends as random stripes. That's a great idea, Jerry. The Jane Stafford online guild is excellent for beginners worth looking at. Yes, I, I totally agree. Yeah, eight two cotton on a rigid heddle. That's actually what my stumbling block was. So let's talk about my next project. That's perfect Z because that goes into my next project. So I created some mood boards a while ago about some stuff that I wanted to make for our house. And I came up with all of these different color palettes. <laughs> and then I went through the color palettes and I took my favorite colors out of them and I put them together. And these are the colors that are in our my home in our home. So I will show you sort of a few at a time, and you guys can watch the uh, slideshow of the palette. So there's these ones that I pulled out of all of these, all of these uh, mood. So I created one big mood board, but these are the palettes that came out that I really liked. And this is two eight cotton. 8-2 cotton, depending on whether you're American or, or um, Canadian, whether you call it 8-2 or 2-8, it's the same thing. And I don't want to drop them. 2-ply um, cotton, just really straightforward. I'm so excited to work with these. It's really affordable. Um, and I'm going to weave it at an 18. Uh, my set is going to be 18 ends per inch, so a little bit looser. I'm not going to try to go for 20 and have to really beat my... Uh, beat my warp and everything, or beat my, use really be heavy handed with my beater. 
Oh, I included a photo. I wasn't sure if I had. So I am going to uh, work on some tea towels. I'm going to wind a six yard warp. I'm going to try to bang out, you know, try to have like six, five tea towels come off so that I have a real collection of them. I know exactly what I'm going to do for my warp and how I'm going to manage my colors and whatnot. And I'm just so excited about this. And the reason why I'm really excited about this is because it is really hard to weave with 2-8 cotton on a rigid heddle. And just because, you know, the, the heddles just don't, they're just not small enough. And I'm going to um, get those on after I finish this. So it's a little bit of a longer term project sort of for like next month. But I really wanted to, I, my, my whole thing around weaving was I've always wanted to make tea towels. I think that every weaver wants to make tea towels. That was one thing that I couldn't do on the rigid heddle and I always came back to the fact that I couldn't do them and I couldn't put them into our guild sale every fall. And that was something I really wanted to work, work towards doing. So now with the Jane, uh, for the next little while, I can do some of these projects and, and sort of bite them off, if you will. And then I can decide what I'm going to do in terms of long-term purchasing a loom. I was talking to my brother yesterday. He's my, my tax guy. Uh, and we've uh, possibly come up with a plan. So uh, I would really, I'm really hoping that within the next year I can procure a floor loom and really make that an intentional part of the content of the show and really get into a much more detailed conversation around weaving with our hand spun. I feel like it's always an afterthought on the show and I want it to be a very intentional part of the show. It doesn't mean that the knitting is going to go by the wayside. I mean, look at this project, right? Like, you know, I wove with it and now I get the opportunity to knit with it. I am never not going to knit because I love knitting and it's so portable and I take it everywhere with me. But I really want weaving to be an, a very intentional part of the podcast and what we do here. And this whole idea of being a minimalist crafter and trying to eliminate some of the extras is part of the reason for some of those thoughts that I'm having is if I can have tools that really spark joy and make projects that really spark joy, but not worry about the end result and the, like the product and be very focus driven, which I tend to be anyways, I feel like some of this other stuff has started to really fall into place for me, which is wonderful. So I would love to hear more from you guys about where you're at in some of that journey. I know there are people in our community who do all the things in our multi-craft jewel. How do you balance it all? Like how do you sort of decide what, how much you spend on your tools to be able to do all these different things? Do you, does it mean that something gets pushed off to the side for a while and you don't pursue it for a while? Like I'd love to hear from you guys a little bit more about how you balance all of that. It's a meaningful conversation and it's really, really important. I think as makers, because a lot of this stuff is a over and above all the other things that we do. All right. Chat is just so. All right. Handspun warp all the way. You are so right. For centuries, it was the only option. And we have examples of incredible handwoven cloth dating back centuries. Absolutely, Erica. I'm so glad that you popped in to say that. I'm doing that as well for dyeing, the mood boarding. I, I'm assuming it's the mood boarding. Uh, oh, she used Photoshop. Yeah, um, it's so great. Last year, my family all got scarves for Christmas. This year, where they will all get towels. Not sure if they like my loom or not. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering that. I was like, if they start getting all of these gifts that are handwoven, like, where is that line between I need this stuff to, like, you know, move in the direction of sort of more of a, like, production weaver versus giving a lot of this stuff as gifts? And I was like, the reality is they're going to get the stuff that doesn't make it to sale. <laughs> anyways, um, I'm pulling you down another rabbit hole. Sorry, Becky. I should say hashtag sorry, not sorry. Um, I know it's hard, right? There's all these different things that we do. But I will say on the podcast, we all have our thing that we love the most. And we all have our thing that kind of pulls us in certain directions. And it doesn't mean that we, we all have to do all the things. I think it just means that there's this opportunity to to engage in all these different things and and it means that our making and our crafting never gets dull you know and it means that when we kind of are saturated with something and we feel like we've learned what we want to learn or gain from that one thing we can take it to the next level by pushing it to that next thing you know and i think with weaving i'm very much there i've kind of done on the rigid heddle what i want to do and now it's time to move to that next thing and that is a very thoughtful process and journey that i have 
been engaging in. So <clears throat> my philosophy is that as long as the bills are paid, crack on. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that, Eve. There is a craftsy, yes, there is a craftsy class, Cheryl, um, on doing tea towels on the rigid heddle using 2A cotton. You're right. Um, craftsy doesn't exist anymore. It's a uh, blueprint, but yes, you're absolutely right. I have watched it. It's, it's good. Um, all right. Diane says, I will not become a weaver. I will not become a weaver. That's so funny. You can never have too many crafts that use fiber. I totally agree. All right, I'm just, we're going to save our, our spinning growth for next time because it's quite long and I'm excited to share it with you. And we're just, I'm going to move the cameras around and we're just going to talk really quickly about housekeeping. And I'm going to have a sip of coffee because I'm really enjoying it. It's funny, Megan, I am just reading your comment. She said, yeah, I said I would never become a spinner and then a dyer and then a weaver. Oops, so she's doing all of them now. It's funny, I think it's a natural progression. Like I think it's a natural thing for many crafter, for many people, creative souls. You know, you, you hear so often of like, you know, the, the, the painter who becomes who moves through sort of an evolution of, of their making. Um, you know, other artists, you, you hear of them moving through their progression of, of things. I, I think it's a really natural thing, you know, to sort of move through on this continuum of things. It doesn't mean that we don't spin anymore. It doesn't mean that we don't knit anymore. It just means that we've got other things that we want to spend our time intentionally on as well as. Um, my knitting, for example, I, I don't tend to sit and knit at home. I just, I just don't. I take it with me and I get my knitting time when I'm at soccer practice and swimming lessons and waiting for pickup and all that different stuff. So for me, there's been this void for a while around what there, there's something missing in our home environment about, about what I want to be spending my time, my, my creative time doing, and it's not knitting. So then it, it's sort of the last year or so has been sort of figuring out like, what is that thing? that I'm missing and, and that I feel that there's a void and, and it's a floor loom. All right. Yeah, it's so true, Diane. It's the lure, the, she says it's the lure and the thrill of learning new things that expand the realm of what we love to do. That's it, absolutely. The other thing for me, my knitting, the reason why I came back to knitting was because when I was in my, um, in university, in my early, in my late teens, early twenties was because I wanted to weave and I couldn't at that time. And then I came to spinning because I wanted to weave. And then now I'm at the point where I'm finally like, I'm going to learn how to weave because I've always wanted to learn how to weave. That has always been my dream. <laughs> All right. That's true, Barb. Weaving does use fiber faster than other crafts, and it is a real stash buster. You're right. I've had to, for the first time, I've had to go out and buy some stuff. Um, you know, and I don't consider this part of my, um, you know, knitting and, and spinning stash, but you're right. I have had to buy some stuff because I just don't have the right materials, and it uses up so much of my stuff so much quicker. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to move on to some housekeeping, and then we're going to say goodbye because I've taken up lots and lots of your time, and I just am so... I'm always just so gr so grateful for the engagement from you guys um, in the chat, and I could spend all day just sitting here responding to you guys, and that is exactly what the craft afternoons are going to be about. It's just going to be me sitting here chatting with you about on chat, me making, doing some making. I bought a, I had this awesome workshop a couple weekends ago that Katrina's has Katrina and her husband put on, and one of the things that Eric kept doing because. The whole idea of the workshop was to make product photography accessible and to help people to photograph their items, particularly people in the guild, because it was a guild workshop, particularly people in the guild who are photographing flat items, so woven cloth. Our guild is very weaving heavy. We have a massive uh, group of, of weavers and which is awesome and one of the things that Eric kept showing everybody was this and I've never had one and it is oh actually I was showing it to you upside down I'm sorry I'll show it to you the right way in just a sec <laughs> it's a tripod cell phone holder 
and that's actually how I shot the video of me weaving. Uh, and I've never had one, and I realized during the workshop that it would be really helpful to have. So this actually attaches to the top of your tripod. It's like nine bucks on on uh, Amazon. I know some people don't like Amazon, but for me at that moment it was the only option. And um, anyhow, I have been using it, and it's been really helpful. And I'm hoping that this means that I would be able to actually film some of those crafternoon, I don't know what we're going to call them. Uh, I was thinking about calling them beat em ups, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that really fits with what we do here. Anyways, beat em ups is a tech term. And I was thinking um, that I could actually have the live stream going and have my, my thing, um, have the live stream going and actually bring you guys to my loom. Um, or to the to the spinning wheel and whatnot. We're not stuck in here in the office for those because the whole idea is that I take you along with me in my making. So anyhow, we're going on tangents, or I am, not you. Housekeeping, 51 yarns spin along. We are currently working through the long and down wools for February. This is the book. You don't have to get the book, but I do highly recommend you get the book. Um, it is on the Ply Magazine website. It is written by J.C. Box Faulkner. And we are currently in February working on long wools and down wools in both the Ravelry group and uh, in the Slack channel for patrons. Uh, you don't have to be a Patreon member to, to participate. However, the just so that you know, there is monthly teaching content. I'm not going to start throwing the book around. Um, there's monthly teaching content that goes hand in hand with the spin along. So if you would like to see what I'm working on and what uh, some of the pointers and tips and things that I talk about in the in a vlog format, then you need to be a Patreon, a patron. But you can just participate. If you would like to participate, just come on over to the Ravelry group, join. We would love to have you. And so we're doing long and down long and down wools this month, which everybody knows are my favorite. And then next month for March we are delving into double coated wools. I love the idea of double coated wools. I don't love spinning double coated wools, but that is for next month. So please come over and join us and we are gonna be entering our third month and don't worry if you didn't do fine and medium last month, you can, you can either catch up and do them because there's tons of chatter in the thread and in the group and you won't feel out of place at all or you can wait and join when we restart again in the new year because we're going to start a group B uh, because there's so many people that are like, I want to do this, but now is not the right time. So we're going to restart it in January and I'm just figuring out what that's going to look like. All right. If you are a small business owner or a maker that's trying to get their brand out there or their making out there, uh, please email me for information on how you could support the show and how I could then support you by reading out your advertise your advertisement on the show. If you are struggling with what that would look like in terms of like photos and having like um, a sort of spread, if you will, while I talk and while I read out the ad uh, and what visually it would look like please contact me and talk to me because i can i can definitely help you to navigate how to do that the last thing is that there is a newsletter for wool and spinning i've announced this um quite a few times so you guys know but if you go to wellfordpearls.com at the very top there is a sign up for the newsletter and it gives you a rundown on everything that's going on in the month in the community so if you're not a patron it tells you all the things that are going on for everyone, if you're a patron, it shows you everything that's going on for everybody, plus all of the patron stuff. If you're curious about what goes on every month and you just kind of want to know, please sign up. It's free. I send you one per month. <laughs> that's it. Um, and it just it helps get, get the news out there in one fell swoop so that you guys know exactly what's going on. So I hope that you think about going over to wellforpearls.com and hitting subscribe. I think that that is it for today. I've been chatting at you for about an hour and a half and I would like to go and refill my coffee cup actually, completely selfishly. Um, I love these live streams. I love this opportunity to sit down with you and to have this time and to articulate some of the things that I am thinking about and to have the opportunity to hear from you guys in, in chat about what you're thinking about and the direction that you're going and you're making. This space and this community welcomes everybody and I hope that you find whatever it is that you're looking for in this in this little community of ours because 
I think we all share at the end of the day, regardless of whether we're a beginning spinner or an experienced spinner or an experienced spinner and a beginning knitter or an experienced weaver and a new spinner. There's so many different combinations of people. Some of us do all of the things, dyeing, crochet, like there's so much. I think our common, the thing that binds us all together and is the common thread, literally and figuratively, is the fiber. And I think it doesn't really matter if you want to delve down, delve into the weaving rabbit hole with me or not the fact is we love fiber and that is what we're here really at the at the end of the day that's really what we're here to talk about so i hope that you feel that same way and i want to just wish you all a happy happy weekend we have a long weekend here in british columbia it's family day weekend so monday everybody is off it's a stat I am working, <laughs> so I am heading off to get all my stuff ready for working for the rest of the weekend, so um, in my day job, quote unquote. I'm starting to call my day job my side hustle. Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> this is now becoming my day job. Isn't that, that's just amazing to me, but um, I have to go and put in my hours at the hospital so that I can still say that I'm a nurse. So until next time, happy spinning, happy weaving, happy dyeing, happy knitting, happy all the things. And I hope you guys have a wonderful couple of weeks. We will connect again. So please watch your Patreon po emails that you get notifications of me publishing stuff because that will have all the dates and the times. All right. Bye, guys. Have a wonderful couple of weeks, and I will talk to you soon.